My name's Chris McCabe and it is uh, my privilege as uh, Chief Executive of the Institute of Health Economics to, to welcome you all this morning uh, to this morning's uh, Health Policy Speaker Series. Uh, I, I'd like to thank uh, Alberta Innovates and uh, Reg Joseph uh, for uh, working with us to, to, to bring this uh, event together and also for uh, the O'Brien Institute at the University of Calgary for uh, helping us bring in today's uh, esteemed speaker. Uh, I think we, we've been doing these since, uh, since 2013 and uh, as a guest I, I've, I've popped into a few over the years. Uh, but it, it's great to, uh, quite early on in my tenure in this post, to, uh, to have another one of these, of these events. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome our guest speaker. Um, for those of you who've uh, met Des, Dr. Des Gorman, in the last uh, couple of days, you'll know we are in for a treat uh, this morning. And uh, so uh, Des is a professor of medicine and associate dean uh, of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Auckland. And uh, he's not just a, a leader in his own country in the area of health workforce planning, but he's a world, world leader in this area. Uh, and uh, when you hear him speak today, I think you will all understand why. Uh, so uh, I just ask you to, uh, to join me uh, in welcoming Dr. Des Gorman. Oh, kia ora tato. just to see if I can get this on the screen. But, um, the subject today about planning and the, dis the disposition and training of healthcare workers for an uncertain future is an issue which clearly motivates most of us and in fact is proving particularly difficult. So I'll quickly get through this to give us as much time as possible as I've been directed for us to have a free-form discussion. I'll define the problem first of all for you, then give you some examples of what I'm talking about in terms of the uncertainty. I'll talk about an approach to health workforce planning that accommodates uncertainty. In fact, it's an approach that actually takes uncertainty for granted. And then I'll give you some um, consistent findings and highly likely trends as have emerged from our own evolution to give you some idea of just what sort of intelligence you can derive from this sort of approach. Um, all predictions of the future health milieu suggest a supply, demand and affordability mismatch. Now that's a truism, and every single health system that I've worked in that's now well over 35, this is true for every single one of them. When the Auditor General's Office sent me their first review of the Alberta health system, I saw a system that I thought had a very high health spend at over $5,000 per person. But looking at that review, I didn't see anything there that I haven't seen everywhere else. All the intrinsic problems were commonplace. The problems, the structural flaws, the weak funding models, there's what I've seen over and over again. So in that context, your health system is not different from any others. Now that's encouraging, as I've said recently, in that you are not in this alone. You don't have a problem which you've created uniquely the disadvantage or the problem that arises of being commonplace is that if there was a simple solution to this, someone would have fixed it. Now this display here um, is the display that this is a, these are New Zealand data, but these data, uh, I use them because I trust them, whereas most other jurisdictions, health data, health economics data, I don't trust. These ones I trust because I actually drove them myself. Uh, <laughs> Now this, this is my lifetime from 1950 through and the blue line running along the bottom is the growth and wealth of New Zealand and the red line is health spend. And we now have uh, a very buoyant economy in New Zealand nominally uh, in terms of nominal GDP growth it's about 5 to 6 percent but health inflation is running at 8.5 to 9 percent. From what I can see of the data from Alberta, I think your health inflation is running closer to 10%. And your economy is certainly not growing by 3.5% per annum or 6% nominal per annum. It doesn't matter that these lines aren't over top of each other, but they need to be parallel. 
you can't afford a health system that's got costs inflating faster than general inflation and certainly faster than wealth growth. What this means is that it's inevitable across most jurisdictions that health will soon be, soon be eating the lunch of education, social welfare, roading and everything else that government has to invest in. At 43% or something of the total provincial spend, health is already an extraordinarily large expense in this province. I guess that didn't matter when you had runaway oil revenues, but it certainly matters when you don't. The problems in affordably, affordability are partly demographic. <clears throat> this is a demographic display for New Zealand. Again, you're not quite as skewed as this. What you're looking at is 2001, 2011 and 2021 cohorts showing the, a skewing distribution of more people in the older age groups. There are several problems with this. First of all, the workforce is ageing and to retain the workforce at work will cost money. There is a health inflation. That's a supply side inflation perhaps as much as 2.5% per annum supply side inflation to maintain the ageing workforce <coughs> at work. You have an ageing community, excuse me, <coughs> you have an ageing community which brings with it a demand side inflation in terms of demand for greater services. Far from public health <coughs> compressing morbidity in the latter years of life, the opposite is true with decompressed morbidity. Clinical medicine's been successful in not concentrating your sickness in the last year of your life. It's now across the last decade of your life. And instead of spending most of your health care once in the last year, you now spend it iteratively across the last decade of your life. And those consumers of health care aren't taxpayers. <coughs> so we have the perfect storm of a shift to people from paying taxes to not paying taxes, from not consuming health care to consuming health care in the context of an ageing workforce as well. It's also partly technological. This is from the Massachusetts General Hospital over the last 200 years. And you see in the top graph declining mortality of patients admitted to Massachusetts General Hospital. And over the last 20 to 30 years, you see that line is absolutely flat. The major changes in life expectancy are, are arising not from medical interventions, but from social interventions and public health interventions. But the bottom line is the cost of per patient at discharge. So part of health inflation arises from an extraordinary influx of technology into health care which adds cost but not value. Whereas we are unbelievably sensitive about controlling the influx of medicines into pharmaceuticals, I mean, into the medical marketplace, technologies are not constrained. Technologies come, the model of care changes. You, in general, there's a very low value transition from that new technological di disruption. And we do not have the ability to control these technological changes. And there's hundreds of them every day. And that's the net effect, runaway, runaway costs. The other problem in here, there's two other problems that sit in here, in terms of costs per patient at discharge. One is the, the uncontrolled shift of technology into the medical, labor ma the medical marketplace. The next is waste. In most jurisdictions where I have led a deep dive into how much of the health spend actually materially achieves something of value, you can argue 30% of most health spends are a complete waste of money. It's an unnecessary admission, an unnecessary investigation, an unnecessary uh, uh, prescription. 30% of everything we do in most jurisdictions I've tested achieve nothing. So before, in fact, we start saying, how do we ration health care? If we have a finite limit to health spend, how do we use a utilitarian approach to determine where the health need has the best utility? I'd suggest the first place to start is how do we eliminate waste? Now, sitting beside waste is treatment injury. Uh, in the US, as you know, the major cause of death is heart disease, followed by cancer, followed by medical error. Doctors and nurses and other health workers kill more people in the, in the average year in the US than a shot run over, die in domestic accidents and so on. The same is true in most parts of the world, for example, in New Zealand again. I'm one on the board of our no-fault compensation system for accidents. Within three years, treatment injury will cost us more money than domestic accidents, industrial accidents and road accidents. What does it mean when the health system hurts more people than the domestic, industrial, environment and roads. What does that actually mean? What does it actually mean when medical error is the third biggest killer of 
in the US. What does that actually mean? From a cultural point of view, what does that mean? And what is the, the cost in the loss of resource in that context? It's also due to loss of productivity. This is important for you to look at because this is the impact of capitation on primary care in New Zealand. This is the cost per unit output, and that's mainly influenced by what happened to general, point, general practice and that inflection point at 2000, 2001 is when the primary care capitation was introduced. So part of our unaffordability is that we often do things which take productivity out of the system. And when you introduce an unstructured, I don't, I'm not a fan of fee for service, but certainly when you introduce an unstructured capitation, that's what you get. You get a substantive shift in productivity. Most health systems don't measure this stuff. I'll leave that as that. It's also due to perverse funding mechanisms. This is the effect of capitation in New Zealand. I'm going to walk over there and point out the graph I want you to look at. This is what happened when a capitation was introduced into New Zealand. And you can see there that across a trend of doctors working less hours in almost every discipline, general practitioners, in response to that capitation, gave up. Uh, they were originally working 40 something hours a week, and you can see they've given up one day per week each. That's official. In our country, the same population as this province, that's essentially the same as 350 GPs retiring. And if you look at the on our call now, and you can find the general practitioners again, which are now a different curve starting at about, and you can see here they've also gone from 10 hours on call a week to four hours on call a week. The perverse funding, the effect of perverse funding on productivity and affordability also applies to fee-for-service systems. This is Australia. And what you're seeing here is the relationship between GP numbers and GP services. This is linear. You double the number of GPs, you double the number of services, you triple the number of GPs, you triple the number of services. So if you don't control the size of the labour market and you can't the medical labour market, and if you have a fee-for-service system, you just have runaway costs and you get more and more activity. If you try and be smarter about it, this is the National Health Service in the UK, and what they did is they tried, they took 25% of the capitation away, unbundled it, then gave it back on the basis of uh, incentivising certain outcomes, but in fact they didn't incentivise outcomes, they incentivised outputs. They incentivised things for asthma, diabetes and heart disease, and for asthma, for example, for, um, diabetes for example, they incentivised HbA1c measurements. So what happened? Activity went up. As you can see, that's, those are measures of activity. Activity went up. Costs went up. But then when they measured what happened, to the long-term health outcomes for people with asthma, heart disease and diabetes, absolutely nothing. The outcome was not improved at all. This was an expensive failure. Why was it an expensive failure? Because it was incentivising activity, not outcomes. So in a fee-for-service system, if you don't get it right, you can generate high levels of activity without value. And this is a, all that happened here is the already compliant asthmatics, diabetics and people with heart disease got over-serviced. So let's go back to the problem definition then. Health planning, in particular workforce planning, is notoriously difficult and traditional approaches are found to be unreliable. In fact, the only truism in health workforce planning is that your plan will inevitably be wrong. No one's got it right, it's inevitably wrong, so you have to start from a starting point of unpredictability and the fact that soon, within a very short period of time, any didactic predictions you make will almost certainly be stood on their head. The healthcare paradox defeats most healthcare planning. Now, what I mean by the paradox, we are, one of the problems in healthcare, and it's something we don't declare, there is a substantive paradox. On the one hand, there's a continual churn of models of care, which I will talk about this morning. There's complete uncertainty. We have a model of care which is suddenly disrupted, it's changed, or it's turned on. And in fact, even when we know a model of care is going to change, I was talking this morning about the change from uh, cervical smear testing is the major way of surveying for cervical cancer to the use of uh, serology 
We've known that's been coming for five years, yet almost across the world, there's been a completeless disruption of laboratory services because of the inability to actually manage that transition. So even when, even when we know a disruption is coming, we have a great deal of difficulty in adjusting that disruption. But anyway, part of the paradox is this complete uncertainty and churn in models of care. The other part of the paradox is that the core operating model in healthcare is recidivist, and that's hospital-based doctor-led. Now, hospital-based doctor-led systems made sense in 1850, when the disease burden was acute and communicable. But if you were designing a health system from scratch in 2017 to meet the burden which is non-communicable, chronic lifestyle illnesses, it would not start with hospitals, and it most certainly would not start with doctors. So we have a core operating model that's recidivist. And in fact, when you start saying, what other industries have such a recidivism? Because the natural history of any human society or any human organisation is to be disrupted internally and externally. That is our nature. That is how we evolve socially. We disrupt. We disrupt internally and externally. So what is it about healthcare that enables this, these temples called hospitals and these gods called doctors to retain this breathtaking autonomy? I can only think of two other industries which are this recidivist, uh, law and education. And as a former dean of a medical school, uh, clearly I had a foot at least in two of those camps. What is it about those, those industries then that make them so recidivist? In my view, it's because they're dominated by a professional power elite that has no interest whatsoever in the core operating model changing. We wrap it on about patient-centred care. Patient-centred, it's been patient-centred since Hippocrates. But I can promise you it's not patient-directed, it's not patient-owned, and it's certainly not participatory. And then in this province where patients don't even have access to their own health records, I find that absolutely breathtaking. So that's the paradox. On the one hand, this extraordinary churn in models of care, but on the other hand, this recidivism. And that paradox makes it breathtakingly difficult to plan. Because on the one hand, nothing's going to change what needs to change. On the other hand, everything is changing. The other things, the failures in planning are also predictable, given that almost always planning doesn't start with user requirements. And in healthcare, we try to avoid any form of design thinking because, in fact, that's just too demanding a discipline. We are normally reacting to a new model of care which arises from a new technology without any evaluation of value. It's an extraordinary phenomenology. So let's give you some examples of the uncertainty very quickly. I'll, look, I'll talk about three disrupted models of healthcare as examples of how things are uncertain. Then I'll look at doctors and nurses in New Zealand to give you some professional examples of uncertainty. So the three disrupted models I've chosen are the discovery of an infective cause of peptic ulceration, the development of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and the development of cancer services based on underlying mutation as compared to the affected organ. Uh, when I was a medical student in 1970, 71, holding a retractor for someone separating the vagus nerve from the stomach to treat peptic ulcers, no one in that theatre thought for one picosecond that three Australians in Perth would discover an infective cause and obliterate an entire model of healthcare. Nobody. Everyone in that theatre knew that we were doing the appropriate treatment for peptic ulceration because it was an imbalance between acid production and the ability of the stomach to repair itself. Overnight, a complete model of care wiped out. Now, <clears throat> the workforce implications of that weren't as severe as they could have been because the gastric surgeons discovered bariatric surgery. We were able to go off and find themselves somewhere else to play. I remember when I was a surgical registrar, the first, one of the very first procedures I ever did was a, um, a cholecystectomy, and that I remember her very well because I was very proud of how well her procedure went. She was in hospital for 12 days, which was usual. It's now overnight. So that entire model of care, with all the intendant care and all the nursing services, gone. The development of cancer services based on the mutation, we don't even know what these workforce implications of this are. We know it's coming. We know that increasingly your cancer will be treated on the basis of its mutation as compared to whether it's on your breast or your bowel. But what does the workforce look like that's going to take care of that sort of service? 
Will it be one for the province? Will it be one for every major centre? What will the technological workforce needed to be at the front door to enable that sort of care? So here's a disruption we know is coming where we can't even define what the workforce implications might look like. So let's look at doctors and nurses then. So if we have uncertainty around models of care, do we have uncertainty in whole workforces? And the answer is yes, we do. In 2008, the WHO did a critical review of not just New Zealand but also the rest of the world, but they came up with a report that was very critical of New Zealand and said they only had, we only had 70% of the OECD average number of doctors per capita and an excess reliance on immigrant doctors. And, and that was a response to the fact that we had a large number of doctors emigrating each year to Australia. In 2001, it peaked at 700, but on average it was about 300 a year. Now, uh, and if some of you heard me tell the story already, in fact, uh, this was picked up by our media. I, one of the problems with health media is that there are only two health stories. One is a catastrophe, the other is a miracle. And nothing else matters to the health media. And they love catastrophes. This was a catastrophe. So they ran around like the headless chooks that they can be. And I was summoned, having just taken on the role of health workforce guru, to appear in front of the ministers responsible for the social ministries. But by the time I got there, they decided that this was a bigger problem than that, so they asked me to appear in front of the whole of our cabinet, which I did, and they asked me what I was going to do about this. And I told them I was going to celebrate, and they said, what sort of ad flippant attitude is that? And I've said, well, it's not often you get things right. We've got it right. The OECD's got 140% more doctors than they need. And they said, where'd you get that from? I said, I made it up. They said, what do you mean you made it up? I said, well, I made it up, so I made it up. Anyway, I mean, there's no merit in their consumption. There's no merit in my assumption. They're both completely merit-free. The point I was making, of course, is that they were saying, you don't have, we don't have 3.1 doctors per 1,000 population. I'm saying, so what? What does 3.1 mean? What does that correlate with? What unmet need does that determine because you don't have 3.1? Who cares? Having said that, um, this was the basic problem. This is on the top, this is looking at export of doctors and nurses, on the bottom is import of doctors and nurses, and that's all the OECD countries. And all you need to know is that New Zealand and Canada are out towards the right. So we're both big importers and exporters. So the issue was how did we fix this? Now, we introduced a series of strategies, and they were quite clever, I thought, and our aim was to get 300 <coughs> down to less than 150 by 2015, over a 10-year period, but by 2012, it had already dropped to less than 50. Now, how on earth did that happen? Well, people were singing my praises and saying, gee, this guy's good, and look what he's achieved. It had absolutely nothing to do with me and my strategies whatsoever, though I was more than happy to take full credit for this. What happened is China, China's economy cooled. China went from 10% growth to 7% growth. That led to a downturn in the steel industry in Australia, which led to a downturn in some of the investments in peripheral systems like the healthcare, which led to changes in taxation, which led to unfavourable working conditions in Australia, and all the New Zealanders came home. So I'd like to think I was somehow able to responsible for precipitating the downturn in the Chinese economy, but I don't think so. What's the point I'm making? What's the predictability of that? In terms of workforce planning, here we were planning this gradual clawback of this emigration changed overnight. In fact, in 2013, we had to put up on a road show to try and find extra jobs for our graduates because all of a sudden we had the opposite problem. We had gone from vacancies to excess number of applicants for jobs, and as you can see there, the retention rate of New Zealand doctors changed over the last few years from a stable level of 75%, we were losing one doctor in four, to about 95%. Many reasons exist to explain this shift, but the rate and the extent was completely unpredictable. And senior doctors now are the most stable public workforce in New Zealand. Completely, utterly unpredictable. Okay, the other problem we had, and it's a problem that you have, is that most of the, the bureaucrats and politicians were misinterpreting our problems as being a global shortage, whereas in fact what we really had was a poor dis distribution. And that maldistribution was exaggerated by the things I've shown you before, which is the impact of a capitation which took productivity away from primary care. Now the importance about this loss of productivity in primary care 
is that the major cause of unmet need in most primary care systems is the availability of the person that you want to see. So if the person that you want to see is now working one day per week less, what do you think would happen to unmet care? It went up. And the distribution changed because all of a sudden if you're pulling 350 doctors out of practice effectively, you are making a substantive shift in the availability of your resource. By the way, the next level in most jurisdictions that impact on unmet need in primary care are not the cost of that care. The next level down are things like childcare and transport. Then you have the impact of cost, which doesn't have an impact on the elderly, but it can have an impact on vulnerable, poor, young people. So I'll skip over that. Well, the point about uh, the only point I would make is that the consequence of the capitation in terms of working, instead of working 10 hours per week on call, going to four hours a week on call, suddenly there was a burgeoning industry of urgent care clinics to make up that service gap. And the other thing is we suddenly started having major workload shift to ED departments. We can't train emergency physicians fast enough. So we caused a maldistribution in the workforce by a funding mechanism that reduced availability of primary care. Now, I'm not a big fan of fee-for-service, but that's one place fee-for-service can work. Uh, in one of the countries where I work, I chair the advisory council in the Sultanate of Oman for the Minister of Health there. And Omanis, like a lot of people with developing health systems, have this belief that the bigger the hospital, the better, and doctors working in the big hospitals are better than the doctors working in small hospitals, and much better than doctors working in communities, and I suspect that's exactly what Albertans think too, just quietly. But they had a predilection to go to hospital if they had an acute health problem, and the hospitals were being overrun by people with very, very minor health conditions. So we introduced a scheme where they had to buy a card for one real, which is $2.60 US, and every time they visited, it cost them 200 baza, which is about 80 cents Canadian. In one year, we took 12 million visits down to 9 million visits. So if transactional costs can govern volumes where you want to govern volumes. But other than that, they're a very blunt instrument. So let's talk about nursing then in terms of nurse participation. Nurse participation in the workforce is closely inversely aligned to general labour market economic conditions and to age, that is, I'll show you in a minute, there's a sharp drop off in effective FTE after the age of 50. Nurse participation is generally independent of health need and of health care planning and funding. For this reason, feasts and famines in the nursing workforce occur as unpredictably as do changes in general economic conditions. What I'm talking about here is that when economic conditions in a country worsen and unemployment goes up, nurse participation goes in the opposite direction. Nurse workforces buffer unemployment in most societies. As economic pressures come on families during economically difficult times, nurses who are often the second income in that family go from part-time to full-time. They come back into the workforce. They go back from irregular work to regular work. And the opposite's true. The minute economic conditions improve, the reverse happens. They go from part-time, from full-time to part-time, and many the many nurses move into other industries. You see, when economic conditions get hard and employment gets hard, nurses who are highly employable across a range of industry go back to the one safe haven where they know they can get a job, which is nursing. So the nurse participation fluxes in and out of the workforce depending upon general economic conditions. And with all due respect to uh, macro economists, these are fundamentally unpredictable. And what it means, for example, in countries like New Zealand with a rapid economic recovery, is we're seeing nurse participation shift. And the same is true for age. Now, this is the distribution for nurses in New Zealand. It's true in most countries I've measured. And that's not normally distributed. There's a sharp drop off after the age of 50. Why is that? Is it the, the uh, given it's a predominantly feminised workforce, is it the age most of the, is it the biological issues for the women of that age? I'm trying to be as delicate as I can. Is it shift work? Is it the horizontal violence that characterises many nursing work environments? Is it the heavy lifting? Or is it the fact that when a nurse gets to 50, it is highly likely that the kids aren't at school and so the school fees don't need to be paid, 
or in fact the mortgage is paid? Is it in fact that there is no longer an economic? Now the issue for nursing leaders is this, what do you need to do to your profession and to the nature of your jobs to change the shape of that curve? What is it about nursing that doesn't hold nurses in nursing after the age of 50? Is it the nature of your job? Is it the fact the only reason why they're there in the first place is the money? What is it about? There's some major issues that need to be addressed here by the nursing leadership around why this particular phenomenon is global. So what I've given you is some examples of the uncertainty. Let's look at an approach to planning which can embrace this uncertainty. Now, when we set out about to do this, uh, I travelled as widely as I could to look at what other people were doing and came back completely disillusioned. I spent a lot of time with the National Health Service, I spent a lot of time with the Europeans. I had been working for most of my life in Australia, um, came to the States a lot. And what I came back said, these guys don't know how to workforce plan. What they're doing is modelling what they need, assuming nothing changes. They're working, they're living in this breathtaking bubble where they think you can say, oh, if I've got X people providing support for Y people, then in two years' time, if it's twice Y, it's twice X, on the assumption that nothing's going to change. And I said to them, well, what period in your life has that been true? So it was very disillusioning. So we made some assumptions. The first was that the IHI triple aim, or at least a local variant, I know that you have a local variant. In fact, you've added a fourth leg to the stool, is that right? Why only, why only a fourth? I mean, what's... Anyway. The triple aim is a demanding. The, the triple aim is a demanding planning template, and, and I strongly recommend it. Now, when we introduced it, and I've introduced it elsewhere, and also in terms of um, more general health planning, the first pushback is that it's not achievable. Well, it is achievable, and I've seen it achieved on many occasions. It just requires it. It's a demanding discipline. The second assumption we made is that workforce planning needs to be dynamic. It's, there is no workforce plan that is a static phenomenon. It is a dynamic, organic thing, because it has to be, because the needs are changing and the conditions are changing. It is not a report that you produce in November 2017. It's a process which continues. And it needs to be integrated with capital and IT planning. You can't plan workforces unless you're saying, what's the capital impact? What's the IT impact? You can't do it. It's an integrated solution set. And it needs to be subservient to agreed, to agreed models of care and service configurations. And we're not going to talk about it much today, but we're one of the few service industries that has no foggy clue what our users want. How does any other service industry plan? They say, what do our users want? What do our users require? OK, what's the operating model we're going to use to deliver on that want or on that need? OK, what do we now need to make that operating model uh, effective? How do we configure services to make that model work? Now, what's the workforce, capital and IT investment we need for that configuration to make that model work to meet that need? Now, that's how user, that's, that's how service industries operate. How do we operate in health? Everywhere I go, this is what you do. You say, this is the workforce we've got. These are the new gadgets we've got. This is what capital we have available. Now, what, how can we configure this lot? Now, these are the models of care which fall out of that, which predictably are the ones we used in 1850 at the Edinburgh Infirmary. Now, and then we go to the public and say, this is what you jokers need. It looks like this. By the way, the Edinburgh Infirmary of 1850, one of the jokes I always used to um, have with my medical colleagues, if we transplanted a physician from the Edinburgh Infirmary of 1850 to a modern hospital today, say Auckland City Hospital where I, where I used to work, um, he'd be a male, because in 1850 there weren't women working at the Edinburgh Infirmary, I can promise you, not as doctors anyway, unless they were there uh, in, in disguise, and one of them, few, two of them were, but anyway, He'd come into the ward with us and he'd say, are those women doctors? And he'd go, get used to it. He'd say, look at the way they're all dressed. They look like they're going to some sort of fancy dress. I mean, they're not even dressed properly. He'd be amused by the technology. Uh, he'd be fascinated by our obsession with mobile phones. But the minute the ward round began, what do you think he'd think? You'd think, nothing has changed. <laughs> look at this. Patients lined up. Passive. Good morning, Professor. Yes, I'm very well, thank you. And of course, the family said, she's just been telling us the last three hours how bloody sick she is. 
And the professor walks past, I'm very well, thank you, professor. And on you go. And so it's the same, same relationship. So in fact, he, from 1850 today, would feel completely familiar with the process we engage in. So this is the, the thing we imposed on the New Zealand health system, that basically they had to come up with district, regional and national plans, and that, that led to service configurations and models of care. And at the very end, we went for an IT capital and workforce solution set, and that whole thing was driven by need. Was the third assumption we made that is health planning is more effective when based on service aggregates such as aged care, rehabilitation, mental health, mothers and babies health. That was an absolute bun fight, that one. Uh, then, when it, then when it was based on professional groupings. You just can't make sense of a joined up service world when you're thinking doctors, nurses, OTs. You just can't work like that. That's not how it works. That's not how the real world engages. So you can't plan if you're planning in silos when the world doesn't work in that way. The fourth assumption we made is that health workforce planning needs to be based on an inclusive set of possible future scenarios for a service aggregate. And these scenarios should be generated by an interprofessional group of clinicians, subject matter experts, and opinion leaders. Now what that is, if you accept the future's uncertain, then don't avoid it. Just simply say, what could all those futures look like? Let's get some idea of what all those futures could look like. Now, who owns those ideas? Well, let's get the opinion leaders and the thought leaders from society together and put them in a room and say, just dream about how aged care could look in 10 years' time and 20 years' time. Now, this can't be owned by a central bureaucracy. It can't be owned by a university. It has to be owned by the thought leaders and the opinion leaders in the professions so that it's owned out there. And where you can get consumer representation, like aged care is easy, vulnerable children's tough, but where you can get consumer representation, get them in the room. Ownership of these visions need to be in the sector and in the provider community and in the consumer community, not owned by some central bureaucracy. The central bureaucracy can use them to derive intelligence, but they've got to be owned peripherally. Now, the way you use these things is that when you get all these visions together, you can do two things with them. You can look at them all and say, well, given our current investment in workforce, how many of those scenarios could we enable? And if the answer, as it usually is, is that one, then understand you had all of your eggs in one basket. And if that one doesn't happen to be the future, then your workforce is not going to look remotely like it should do. Um, similarly, you can look cross-sectionally across all the scenarios and say, look, all these wonderful opinion groups have given us all these different positions of the future in aged care, rehabilitation, mental health and so on. What are the consistent observations? What are they all telling us and how can we use that to invest? For example, they were all telling us that we needed to shift care into the community. So there's a consistent finding. How do we shift our investment from hospital-based workforce to community-based workforce. Because if the shift's going to occur, there's going to need to be some capacity to enable it to occur. The next thing is that, the next assumption is, if the future's uncertain, then the last thing you want are super specialists that go down a super speciality pathway as soon as possible. And the last thing you need are people you can't retrain and redeploy. And if I looked at the Alberta health workforce, like most workforces, it is spectacularly non-redeployable, non-retrainable, and there are people that have gone down very narrow scopes of practice very early in their careers. That's the best way I know of making sure that you're coding for disruption and redundancy and misalignment in the future. If you are planning for uncertainty, then what you say is, I don't want endocrinologists. I want general physicians that have an interest in, general, in endocrinology. I don't want cardiologists. I want people who are trained in general medicine and cardiology. I don't want OTs, physios, and speech language therapists. I want rehabilitation workers that can do speech language therapy, occupational therapy, and physiotherapy. I want people that are generically trained and redeployable. I don't want training schemes where emergency medicine, critical care medicine, and family medicine, and rural hospital medicine are silos. Because when you look at those medical disciplines, 95% of their skills and competency are the same. So you're saying, that's ridiculous. Give them common core training, and then just advanced training in the sub-disciplines. So when they want to redeploy, you're not having to go back and start all over again. That's just straight-line logic in terms of an adaptation to an uncertain future. <clears throat> 
To date, uh, to give you some idea of how this works, we've done 17 health service aggregate forecasts. There have been some specific outcomes to the aggregate, which includes the development of novel workers. Most diabetes care in many areas now is run by diabetes registered nurse prescribers, not nurse practitioners. They're registered nurses who've done a 12-week course to prescribe in diabetes, because most diabetes care sits within a nursing paradigm. And we've also done some cross-sectional analyses which show consistent findings. Now, the nurse prescribe is an example of one thing we've done that works well. To encourage these groups to believe that what they're doing is important, we scan their reports looking for good ideas we can implement. And we pick them off and we implement them. And they suddenly realise that what we're doing is serious and what they're doing matters and that we're paying attention to it. And the diabetes nurse prescriber was a classic example of a good idea that popped up which we grabbed, implemented very quickly, and you can see all of our working groups saying, we must be very careful what we tell these jokers because they're going to do something about some of our better ideas. So cross-sectional analyses work. I mentioned to you before that when you look across all these dozens of scenarios, the one consistent message is we want to shift the point of care into the community. Now, that's a qualitative outcome, and this is qualitative workforce forecasting. But we then use quantitative probing to say, if we want to shift the point of care into the community, is that possible with the traditional model of family medicine, where someone identifies a health problem and goes and sees their family and doctor and says so? Is that possible? So we simply said to our modelers, how many general practitioners would we need to enable this shift in care? And they came back, they say, you'd need to graduate an additional 300 GPs every year to meet that shift. So suddenly you have very powerful intelligence, don't you? Which is this, the shift in care from hospitals to the community cannot be based on the traditional model of general practice. That's very powerful intelligence. That shift in care requires a completely different model. You cannot simply crank up the existing model to address that shift. That's what that says. So let's look at some consistent findings very quickly to give you some idea of how these systems mature. Um, in fact, I'll skip over these very quickly because I want to... The first thing is that... The, the first thing it shows is that it has reinforced the point we make that the, the, the scenarios, when these groups meet year by year, the scenarios change very, very quickly. So that demonstrates how dynamic this is. The second thing is more of the same by way of models of care is not appropriate. We've shown very clearly is that when we for forecast, simply assuming that what you're doing now is going to meet the needs in the future is unacceptable. I'm just going to skip across these quickly so we have time for discussion. Um, there is a real problem with barriers. Innovations don't spread, and what I've given you here is what prevents innovations spreading shortfalls in clinician and health system leadership, inadequate health system intelligence, restrictive business models, which is the most important, uh, perverse funding systems, res restrictive regulatory practice, the threat of litigation, and territorial behaviour by potentially disrupted craft guilds. Those are the reasons why disruptions don't spread. The only time anywhere in the world I have seen innovations spread is when we ran a system for elective surgery where we said to providers in a region, Here's your target. If you hit this target for elective surgery, we'll give you more money. In the event that any one of you in the region doesn't hit your target, no one gets the money. One region early on, God bless them, didn't hit one of the providers in one region didn't get it. They didn't get the money. So they all suddenly realised we were serious. And what happened then was extraordinary. I've got too many surgeons. You've got an excess workload. Let me give you my surgeons. I'm doing something clever. Why don't you look at this? Why don't you look at ours? There was this extraordinary outbreak of innovation spread because we had mutualised the risk. The only time I've ever seen innovations cross the street. I mean, I've seen primary care centres across the street from each other, and these guys are doing some clever shit, and these guys are doing some clever shit, but it's not the same stuff. And their ideas don't cross the road. But the minute we mutualised risk, it certainly did. They were running across the road with each other's good ideas. But that's the only time I've seen healthcare innovation as a joke. Innovation lives and dies with the person who innovated it. You know, it's not my idea. It's not a good idea. I mean, it's, the egos in healthcare are quite significant, aren't they? A, a current company accepted. <laughs> um, the point I'm making here, and I'll quickly skid over this,
is that the most outstanding observation these forecasts have shown us is that we are not configured for the future. The hospital-based, doctor-led model of care made sense 150 years ago. The, uh, we've also found some individual groups, for example, one of the advantages that come out of this very quickly is you say, look, it doesn't seem to matter what the future looks like. We've got too many psychologists, dentists, pharmacists, opticians and physiotherapists, and no matter what the future looks like, we're dead short on oral hygienists and a few others. So you do identify very quickly some areas where investment's going to be reasonably secure. Um, some big deal stuff, New Zealand will like, has and will like it to have enough doctors. Uh, but the point I'm making here is that we want to drive to a, to a low vacancy model for three reasons. One, we want to reduce our reliance on overseas trained doctors. Two, we want to change how we reward doctors. Uh, in most jurisdictions there is a misconception, there's a shortage, and so doctor remuneration is based on recruitment and retention. We want to shift the remuneration of doctors to quality and productivity. Now to do that requires an oversupplied medical labour market. And the third thing is we want to shift them to where we need them. Flooding a medical labour market will not cause doctors to go and work where we need them to work, but an oversupplied labour market creates an environment where we can invoke strategies to shift them. Flooding it won't do it, but flooding it provides a nice background to do it. And as we talked last night, there are seven things I think you need to do in concert to redistribute the workforce, but it's easier to engage those seven when you have a slightly oversupplied medical labour market. Um, the problem with nurses, very clearly, this is a thing from the nursing leadership. The, the, we are, like everyone else, having to come to terms with how do we change the dynamics of, work, of, of nurse participation at work. And this is the other big finding we've had. We want to shift the point of care into the community, and yet in every jurisdiction I've been involved with, the people who provide care in the community are under-trained for the task. And that's because it's a low wage industry. That's how it works. And so we're going to have to upskill these people in a way where the productivity gains adds value. That is a huge challenge. We can't shift the point of care without, without that investment. And if that investment causes significant wage inflation without a big gain in productivity, that entire industry is going to go pear shaped. So what I've done today is defined a problem, I hope, that the future's uncertain. I've given you some examples of the uncertainty by way of models of care and also um, some profession examples. I've shown you an approach which, and it is not the only approach, but I, what I'm trying to show you is that an approach is possible which actually doesn't uh, ignore or avoid the uncertainty but engages with it. And that you can get consistent findings to provide you with the intelligence you need to invest in workforce development with some security, and, and thank you very much. Well, thanks uh, very much, Dr. Gorman. And uh, actually, now we have time for uh, some questions. So I have a mic. So if people want to put up their hand or they have a particular uh, uh, question, be happy to um, pass it off to someone. Yeah. No, I might even be happy to answer it. Lee. If you could just uh, introduce yourself, just when you... Lee Green, Chair of Family Medicine at the University of Alberta. Um, <clears throat> so I want to I want to needle you a little bit about uh, the comment on capitation a as a way of of uh, getting at some issues in measurement and consequences. So if you introduce capitation, and the number of hours physicians work drops, but your access doesn't go down, and your severity adjusted panel size uh, doesn't go down, and your quality measures remain good or, or even improve, what do you care yep, no, how many, right. I mean, that, that's not a measure of no, right. productivity. That's exactly the kind of regressive measure. So what, what I hear in that is not that capitation had an unintended consequence, but that it was done wrong, and it's just a lesson in what gets managed yep. is what gets measured. Yep. No, Introduce it with measures of access, and you know you lose some of your capitation if your uh, if your ED use for for primary care sensitive conditions no, goes look, up. I, I don't interrupt you, but I, yeah. don't, don't get me wrong. I'm actually a fan of capitation. 
What I've just shown you is a dumb capitation. No, no. Look, the um, the first clue we had that the capitation was perverse was those fall off in hours. Uh, what's happened since then is that there has been a demonstration of reduced availability and increased unmet need. Uh, I'm actually a fan of capitation, but capitations have to be accountable. Uh, we're, we're now in the difficult thing of unbundling this capitation to introduce one that's sensible. And I think provinces like yours can go straight to phase two and avoid all this from phase one. There are four things I think need to be happening in a capitation. One is the contract needs to impose some performance metrics, such as if I contact, if I'm enrolled with you and I contact you, you need to see me within a certain period of time. By the way, as a generalisation, that capitation there, the drive was to enrol as many people as possible who would never come and see you. That's what that was. You want to enrol as many people as possible with low health needs and then make yourself unavailable. That's what that was. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's so the, the first thing is there needs to be some performance metrics. The next thing there needs to be some agreed outcome measures and, and we are now getting people to volunteer to have some of the capitation at risk in terms of their outcome outcome performance. The third thing is that Capitation is driven by the better you are, the more enrolments you get. So there needs to be some publicly available data to enable people to make a choice about who they enrol with. The great furphy here was that people could choose who they enrol with on the basis of what? How do you exercise choice if there's nothing to enable choice? And the final thing that we're introducing uh, is we have high needs people where there's extra money attached to them. The money has to follow the choices they make, not be given to the primary care organisation, because once the money's handed over, there's no incentive to service that particular community. So do capitations work? Yes, if they're accountable, and yes, if there's financial and outcome risk in the capitation. What I've just shown you is not a criticism of capitation, it's a criticism of dumb capitation. So the reason why I interrupt you is not to be rude, but just to say, hang on, I agree with every word you're saying. Yeah, and then he... Um there was actually just one uh, question, Des, following up on uh, the diabetic nurse prescriber. I was just wondering about regulatory changes that you had to do that yeah. I assume would have been led by the government around scopes of practice. Was there uh, resistance to different professions yeah. having to expand that? And was that a, a major strategy you had that, to address? Yeah, the legislative reform, John, was one that I led. Um, and we have reformed the Medicines Act to be based on competency, not what professional group you're on. And in fact, most of the barriers I've, we've experienced in everywhere I've worked in terms of getting more permissive and prescribing environments comes not just from my profession, but in the case of nurse prescribing, comes from the nursing profession. Some of the nursing councils are unbelievably difficult to work with because they impose crazy hurdles for the nurses to negotiate, to move into prescribing roles. Now in the case of diabetes prescribing, there's a reasonably constrained pharmacopoeia, but I want to emphasise this. Nurse prescribing in diabetes in New Zealand is part of an integrated care model with a shared care record. It does not occur as an isolated event. It's integrated. Um, I would not encourage a disruption of care continuity and homogeneity by adding new providers that weren't integrated. So, no, the answer was it required a change in the Medicines Act. And uh, just before I pass over, are the future scenarios that you identified, the 171, are those, uh, were they made generally available publicly? Did oh, the yeah, public no, they're, they're all available on the website. Uh, some of them you'll laugh at already. Some of them make sense. That, John, they don't, they're, not a, they're not a statement of what the future will be. We encourage people to just say, what could it look like? Hi, my name's Tanya Iwashko. I'm uh, with Alberta Health Services, um, and I've worked in a number of areas, and I'm, I'm one of those physiotherapists you alluded to from way back. Um, my question relates to uh, consideration of culture in, uh, in our province, and I'm thinking of yours as well because you have a large Maori population. Um, to what extent is there some consideration of various cultures or a dominant culture in terms of your workforce planning? Because I believe 
in our scenario right now, we're, we're very, very concerned about our Indigenous population and how our health system is meeting their needs. And so I do think it's an important consideration in the workforce planning scenarios, and, and I'm curious as to how you've thought about that in, in yours. The, um, I'd compare and contrast um, two countries for you. One is New Zealand, the other is Australia. By the way, I'm, my mother's Maori. Uh, my father's Europe. Well, they both did, but um, as I've said several times in the last few days, I'm the white sheep of our family. Um, so... In New Zealand, uh, racial affirmation in medical programs is non-negotiable. Um, there are 15% of New Zealanders have a Maori ancestry, which we call a whakapapa, and 15% of med actually 20% of medical students are Maori. Uh, we're about 10% of nursing students are Maori. So each of the schools have a non-negotiable affirmation target. And when I introduced that into um, the Faculty of Health at Auckland University, I had huge resistance. Even in a country where there is a treaty between Māori and the colonising Brits, uh, and even in a country where the treaty establishes biculturalism, that was, you know, I had visitations as dean, I had visitations from families, understandably saying, my son, my daughter's got better grades than that brown kid, and yet they're in med medical school. And, my, and I, you can understand that. My response was that your kid won't go and work in a Māori community in Gisborne for me. Um, we can, New Zealanders are quite broadly enculturated. It's one of the least uh, divisive countries on the basis of ethnicity or culture on the planet because we've just grown up with an inherent multiculturalism. But even in that context, there had to be a non-negotiable affirmation target in position to shift it. Now, <clears throat> when Māori come to us at medical school, they require two to three years of bridging to get the learning skills they require to compete. Because what, what was happening before my time, what Māori did come to medical school failed. So the first kid from that whānau family to come to university goes home a failure. Well, well, that's just coding for generational failure. So we make them do a bridging course. And we now have as many Māori getting distinction in the final year of medicine in both the universities as we do European or Asian kids. Um, Australia still talks about racial information on the same basis, wrings the hand and just says it's too difficult. Uh, you know, they say that the cultural differences between Aboriginal Australians and European Australians is too great. You know, they'd, they'd be happier walking around the bush naked, throwing sticks at kangaroos, and how on earth do you recruit people like that to medicine? It's a, it, the difference is uh, extraordinary. The difference requires a clear, non-negotiable affirmation on the basis that the workforce needs to look reasonably similar to the community you're serving. Now, the proof of the pudding will be improved health outcomes. If I'm right, and if the social libertarians are right, health outcomes should improve. At the moment, we're seeing Maori health uh, improving parallel with European health, but the gap's not closing. But at least it's parallel. It's not like in Australia where it's divergent. At least it's parallel. So we're encouraged, but I'll think what we're doing is successful when the life expectancy absolute difference is, is gone. The problem for Māori in shorter lives is tobacco and alcohol. And we just have time. Uh, time for another quick two questions. So just here and then Ben over. Hi, I'm Stacy with the uh, Surgery Network here in Alberta. Uh, I find it very interesting your comment about nursing. I think we definitely see that right now with um, you know the price of oil and gas. We see the nursing workforce increase, full time EFTEs increase and then the drop off at 50. What I think is interesting is that um, the nursing workforce is a controllable workforce, is a controllable, you know, as an organization, you know, they can cut this workforce. <laughs> and the physician workforce is separate. And so I, I worry about what we're doing because the idea of nurse prescribers or, you know, some alternate method using that workforce we're essentially eliminating and encouraging that workforce into that space where they are increasing to drop off and we're cutting uh, um, a huge amount of workforce because we can right now to save, to try to drop that 43% in cost. That's a piece of workforce that we can control right now. And I worry about what that's gonna do to us down the road. Oh, Stacey, I agree with you entirely. I think um, innovation is not getting a nurse to run the sort of clinic that a doctor would ordinarily run that's just a slightly cheaper provider in a particular model of care. Uh, 
And we know that 50 to 80 per cent of primary care contacts in Australia and New Zealand, for example, could be managed electronically. We know that in the US, some of the health systems there have virtualised large trunks health care. That's innovation. My concern in the future, Stacey, is enough nurses to provide the nursing care required in our health centres, not nurses moving into extended roles. I'm not to discourage nurses moving to extended roles. I think that's fantastic. There needs to be some ability within the career of nursing to take on different challenges. But my concern in most jurisdictions is nurses to provide core nursing services. So I, I agree with you entirely. And I th the challenge I keep making to nurse leaders is how do we reconfigure the profession and career of nursing to make it invigorating and able to sustain nurses despite the economic conditions and despite their age. And that's a challenge I'll keep making to nurse leadership because, in fact, I've had several doctoral students study what is it about nursing that makes nurses lead to the age of 50. There's no single factor. There's a whole list of them. Don't need the money, sick of the shift work, sick of the horizontal violence. That needs to be fixed. Over and over again, nurses leave nursing. They say, I'm just sick of being bullied. Uh, and then there's this thing. So there's a whole raft of things. So it's not one thing, well, it's just that, fix this. It's not just put more money into nurse salaries. That's an issue. But there's a whole raft of things. And it's going to require a comprehensive address. Now, what happens, though, Stacey, is that when economic conditions deteriorate and the nurse workforce floods, uh, everyone thinks, oh, we don't have to worry about that anymore. So there's a cycle of anxiety, oh God, it's fixed itself, anxiety, oh God, it's fixed itself. There needs to be a stand back saying, no, we need to get, we need to turn this into this. So I agree with every word you just said, I think it's a, it's a genuine concern, but we need the nurse leadership to actually do something called leadership. Okay, and just uh, now one last question, Min, over to you. Hi there, um, Min Ali Khan, oh, uh, advisor. Uh, Advisor to uh, the Ministries of Health for Alberta and Ontario. Um, Des, you heard me say this the other evening, um, you know, to quote, um, you know, Maureen Vizignano and uh, Don Berwick uh, when they talk about health care, um, that they often say that we have the wills, uh, the, the people, the will, the ideas, but we often lack an execution. My own general observation in healthcare is that we tend to be a relatively risk averse um, industry. And I think because of that, we sometimes use the crutch of the fact that change takes a lot of time. Um, you know, we need to pilot things to the nth degree. Um, you know, can you speak um, perhaps, I mean, what you've been talking about the past couple of days has been so stimulating and so inspiring and enlightening. Could you speak a little bit more around the trajectory that you yourself experienced, your teams, from the time of you know, ideas and formulation of strategies to actual execution, yeah. and the time it took for you to actually see the outcomes as well? Thanks, Min. Uh, the point Min makes is if I was looking for the most consistent observation across all the health systems I've reviewed, it would be that they're strategically okay, but tactically very weak. Where we fail in most health systems is our ability to implement. The problem's not in generating ideas, the problem is in implementation. You're quite right. And most ministries are very risk adverse. Most healthcare systems are very risk adverse, yet the irony is we have this technological flood driving costs which is almost unconstrained. Um, I hate pilots, not when flying, I'm flying back to New Zealand tonight so I'll, have, I'll, I'll make sure that that <laughs> point of view doesn't get expressed to the front, but uh, uh, pilots, look, every health system has a warehouse full of failed pilots and a building full of successful pilots which they haven't carried forward with. We see a problem, we set up a pilot, we say let's suck it and see what happens. Uh, it finishes, we say well so many things have changed we can't even evaluate this damn thing now. Or because the person who drove the pilot has moved on, no one else picks it up and it just drops. Uh, health systems like pilots because no one has to put any real skin in the game when they do a pilot. Um, by contrast, the approach we've adopted not only in New Zealand but elsewhere, we call action research methodology. And I'll give you a very simple example. Um, 
one health board came, uh, when I was on the, running the National Health Board, one health board came to us and asked for $60 million for new operating theatres on the basis that they would increase their surgical outputs and so on and so forth, which, and they were going to run a pilot men of testing how this works. Um, what we did instead was say, no, look, that's a, no one trusts you. Treasury doesn't trust you, we don't trust you. Uh, health systems always talk about avoided costs. When you're looking at disinvestment, if it's not a line item on a budget, which you have a plan to realise, it's bullshit. Avoided costs are a fantasy. Real costs sit in a budget and you can, you can take them out of the budget and they're no longer there and it affects the bottom line. That's avoided savings. But anyway, what we said is, look, what we can see is that your surgeons, for example, your orthopaedic surgeons, when they're working for you, they're doing two hip joint replacements a day. When they're working in private, they're doing six. So let's say that success here is four joint replacements per day. Let's say that we're going to get to four. The answer will be four. So we've defined success. Success in this simple case is four hip joint procedures a day. Now this is what you, this is what the configuration you think you need to get to four, but you will change whatever you need to change to hit four. It's non-negotiable target. You will hit four. And what we will put the learning in around is what you had to do to get to four. So the learning are the changes you did, the adaptations you made to hit success. And then the other thing we said is, and when it is successful, we need a signed commitment from you that this will become business as usual and from your regional neighbours. So how did it differ from pilots? We defined success and said you will change whatever you need to change to be successful and you'll be committed to this becoming business as usual when it is successful and you need to have a commitment from the region that if this model, when this model is successful, there'll be broad implementation. In the space of a year, men, they hit six a day. They had reduced bed stays, they had reduced redo rates, they had reduced infection rates. The cost went down 17%. Of the, the, of the procedure. So they did it faster, cheaper, more and more efficiently. And what we were able to publish for the other health boards is these are the things these guys did. And by the way, the most interesting thing they did was uh, to separate the elective and the acute campuses. They said this is the acute factory which brings whatever happens. This is the elective campus. Now, what they worked out is they were losing 20% per day of surgery time in the debate between surgeons about whether the acute case had greater significance than the elective case. There was this huge waste of time, so they separated out. The other advantage of that is the people who loved the cut and thrust of what's coming in the door headed to the acute factory. The people who wanted the security of the daily churn went to the chronic factory. So what the other district health boards learnt was that there's a huge productivity gain by separating out these quite different streams of surgical practice. So we are weak tactically and the way to shift to implementation is to use the same sort of project management that any other industry we use, which is to say we can't afford, particularly underfunded health systems, can't afford to suck it and see and go, oh well, never mind. Predetermining success, having a clear view of what success looks like and determinedly hitting it is what implementation is about. So that surgical example means a very simple one compared to mental health, or, but it's, it illustrates the process. That whole thing was done, by the way, in less than a year. Yeah. Well, thanks uh, very much. And uh, please join me in uh, thanking again Dr. Gorman.